world. All right, everybody, welcome to the Ephesians, the Echo Church Ephesians midweek study. Uh, this is Pastor JD, and uh, I'm with a bunch of folks. Good turnout this week. It's, it's fun to see everybody's faces on here. And, uh, and as usual, we're going to have uh, not just a lecture. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, an interactive time where questions and answers and you guys are going to come up with questions and comments and thoughts and uh, we're going to continue our look through the book of Ephesians. We're moving our way through. We're going to be through a good portion of chapter five after today. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to jumping in. Let me open us in prayer and, uh, and let's ask the Lord's blessing upon our time. Lord Jesus, we come to you uh, during a time when the, it feels like the world and definitely the country is in turmoil. And uh, the last couple of days have been nail biting as we have just uh, seen so much uh, pain, devastation, physical destruction, uh, and even um, people being hurt and even killed. Um, it's with those it's with those hearts of grief and with un great uncertainty that we turn to you the one who has always been our rock the one who's always been our foundation and we turn to your word which is your revelation of of who you are to us and like you your word is a rock your word is something we can turn to and hold to and and, and, and say to our hearts, say to our minds, get, get onto the wavelength of God's word, that we can, we, can, we can know where to run, that we can know what to think, that we can know how to act according to your word. And so, Lord, thank you for this stability in our lives. Uh, we confess now more than ever that we need it. And we confess now more than ever that we need you, the God of the word. And so, God, would you please come and would you meet us and would you fill us with worship as we spend time in your word together? We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to switch over now to um, our screen share and just give me a thumbs up if you guys can see the text. Okay, yep. Thank you. I'm always uncertain about that when I switch over. Okay, <clears throat> so... We've been working our way through Ephesians. We, I'm not going to go back and do a full recap of chapters 1 through 3, but we could sum it up by saying that Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 is about um, what we have in Christ and what God's plan is uh, on us as individuals to save us and to call us to himself. And then towards the end in chapter 3 to gather us together into his church. And there's very little in Ephesians chapter one through three that we need to do. There's very little um, ethics, if you want to call it that. There's there's very little statement saying do this, do that. There are there are there are some of those. There are remember that's a that's a that's one that appears. So get your mind focused on this. Make sure you're seeing this and understanding this. Um, those are some of the, the commands that you see in chapters one through three, but you see relatively few. And so <clears throat> what we've been taught in chapters one through three is to love the truths that are simply true about us because we are in Christ. They are true about us the moment we come to Christ. And uh, for instance, that we have been saved by grace through faith. And this is not of our, our, our own doing, right? This is not our works, so that no one can boast. Um, and then not only that, but that we've been gathered into a church, Jews and Gentiles, been gathered in together, and Christ already on the cross removed the dividing wall of hostility so that Jew and Gentile, and what we might say today is different people, people that come from different places would be one. They would come together, as the Bible says, into one man or one one. Um, one person, and that's speaking about the church, the whole, the whole church. And I would even argue that's speaking about the whole local church, that it's a, a local church forms one person. And so the differences and the disparities between those people actually enhance for God's glory uh, the plan of what he is doing to display his manifold wisdom 
to not just human beings, but to the entire cosmos, to the entire universe. And that includes uh, what, what, the, what Ephesians calls the heavenly places, which is probably something akin to the, the angelic realm where, or where, where angels and demons are. And God is wanting to display himself even there. And so this manifold wisdom of God is put on display by the church being different and yet loving one another. And so you were called as an individual to Christ. You were called as an individual to gather with the church. And then in Ephesians chapter four, he switches and he begins to say, okay, if all of that is true, how then should we live? What should we do? And the banner of all three chapters, four through six, is going to be this. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That is the banner. That is the theme verse, the thesis over Ephesians chapters four through six. And so everything that happens from that point forward is under that idea. How then should we live? We talked about unity in the body being of first importance to the Apostle Paul. The first thing Paul does once he gets to ethics in the Christian life, once he gets to how do we live, is unity. We are called to unity before we are called to anything else. Now, today we're going to talk about sexual ethics. But I, the, it's, it's important to say that just because Paul puts unity first doesn't mean unity comes at the expense of everything else. Okay. So for instance, we don't throw out other things that God says are sin or, or say that those are not sin for the sake of unity. There's a, there's a, there's a movement in the church called ecumenism. It's E-C-U-M-E-N-I-S-M, -E ecumenism. And ecumenism is the idea that we need to just put aside all differences within historic Christianity and just go back to some very, very simple uh, things about who God is and basically bring Christianity down to maybe the lowest common denominator that everybody can agree upon and then reunite with Catholics, reunite with, uh, with Eastern Orthodoxy, reunite with maybe a lot of the other denominations and groups and stuff that are, that are in church and just be one church again. And because, because it's all about unity, right? It's everything's about unity. And they would point to this and they would say, Ephesians chapter four, do you see here? First thing Paul's saying here, first thing he's talking about is unity. And the, the, the thing is, um, we don't have unity at the expense of other things that we convictionally hold to be true about God's word. Okay. So what we do is we, we, we have to see God's word first and say, that is true. When, when God speaks about justification in his word, when he speaks about how it is that a person comes to know Christ, we have dis disagreements with the Catholic Church on that. We have di disagreements with the Eastern Orthodox Church on that. Um, now, there are some disagreements which maybe are silly, and maybe some disagreements we should put aside. But there are many things that we have to hold to convictionally, convictionally because they're God's word. And then we find unity, not in the universal church necessarily. We find unity within a local church based upon an agreed upon understanding of God's word and of the things that God would call us to do. So for instance, at Echo Church, you sign, uh, to become a member at Echo, you sign a statement of faith. And what that statement of faith is saying is, I'm agreeing that this is the way I'm approaching scripture. I'm coming to scripture with some of these basic, um, maybe uh, important uh, doctrines in scripture, and I'm signing that I agree to those things. And then you sign a statement, uh, a, a church covenant, which the church covenant is not so much about what you believe, although it does include that, but it also includes what do you, what are you willing to, how are you willing to live? Um, what kind of ethics are you willing to have? Are you agreeing to what scripture says or what we're arguing scripture says when it comes to how a Christian should live? And then you also sign a, sign a statement on marriage and sexuality, where you, you, will, you would sign a statement saying, I'm agreeing to these particular hot button issues in the culture today. I'm agreeing to these things. Now, what happens then is that once it's, a, it's as if those, doc, those, those documents form a boundary where we're saying, okay, by stepping into the church, you're stepping inside of those documents and you're agreeing to those documents. And then what we find is we find that unity takes place. 
Unity takes place because we've established God's word. It takes place because we've agreed upon God's word in certain places. And therefore, within the, within the local church, unity happens. So I just wanted to say that because uh, unity is here first because I think it's most important. However, I don't think it ever comes at the expense of other things that the Bible says. So you don't throw those out because you want unity. So that's unity. That's the, this is really the whole beginning section here is Ephesians 4, uh, 1 through 16, all the way to the place where he see, we see now the results of unity. What happens because unity is happening in the church? Well, we grow up in every way. Well, what are we doing? How are we unified? Well, we speak in the truth to each other in love, into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, this is every individual within the body, makes the whole body, the whole, grow. Every individual makes the whole grow. When we're joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, so that it, here's the result now, builds itself up in love. That's what we're doing as Echo Church. We are gathering in unity with one another and working using our gifts and praying to, the, to God to help us. And we are building up one another in love. So then we moved last week to some now some specifics of how do we live then as Christians. Um, he started with unity, but he'll move on now. He'll move on to more of normal sort of ethics of how do I, you know, certain areas of life, how do I, how do I live? And what you'll find is that what Paul's going to start to do is he's gonna start, start to get more and more specific. He's going to start by talking about how, hey, don't live like the Gentiles do. Well, that's very, that's very broad. It's very vague. It's just, you know, hey, here's how, you know, there's a general idea of how they live. Don't live like them. And here's why they live the way they do. They're darkened in their understanding. But that's not you. You're a Christian. So put off the old self and put on the new self. Now, that's very 30,000 foot view. Just Here's in general what you're supposed to do. Vague isn't the right word. Vague's not, vague's not right. Um, it's general. But now, starting in verse 25, we start getting very specific. Therefore, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. And what I said last week is I, I, think, I think lying has a very central place on the list of sins. Because... Lying is the sin that will actually hide other sins, if you think about it. If you are somebody who is prone to a particular sin, and we all are, we all have our, our particular weaknesses or pronenesses because of how we're made and because of who we are as sinners, lying, if you, if you bring that on top of it, will actually cause it, if, it, if it's really fully a complete lie over the entirety of your life, it, it can actually completely do away with repentance, that there will be zero repentance for that sin because you've hidden that sin rather than brought it to light. And so it's interesting to me, I said it last week, I just want to repeat it, that he begins with lying here, that speaking the truth with other people and putting away falsehood is number one on Paul's list when he actually gets to the specifics of how we should live with one another. And it does get back to the beginning of chapter four when he says that we should speak the truth in love. So that would be the opposite of lying here. That would be speaking the truth. And here he says it again, speak the truth with his neighbor. He moves from there to being angry. We talked about this last week. What does it mean to be angry and not sin? And I think the idea here is that we are, um, we, we, there, is a, there is a season of time that we want to act to seek out forgiveness with another person. Jesus would say it's so important to, to reconcile with your brother that you should leave your gift at the altar. Like you should not even worship God in that way of giving, bringing your gift to God before you have gone and reconciled to your brother. It's that important. And so it's kind of the same idea here. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. I don't think is literal. I don't think it means that you have one day and if you fight at, you know, 
just before sunset, you got to be done before the sun sets. I think it's metaphor. And I think it's speaking about a, a, a reasonable season of time that you don't want to let go by. And so that's really the end of where we got. And then we were kind of, we're, we're going to begin in 28 and talk through the rest. But I want to stop and pause for questions, thoughts, um, comments, things that surprise you. Hey JD, um, hey, what's um, what's uh, how would you tell people to like, for example, this part about um, not letting the sun go down on your anger? How do you discern whether that is uh, a metaphor, as you're saying, or actually literal? That mm. you know that as you talked about last week, in terms of it being a a very practical marriage advice. And you don't necessarily think that is what this verse is saying, but more don't let your anger continue on for, for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, one of the things we want to do, and this may not be extremely helpful given your question, but you want to see it in context. What's first thing we want to do is we just want to make sure we've got the, the whole verse and the whole idea here that Paul seems to be concerned with giving an opportunity to the devil. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that we've solved it. That doesn't mean that we now know what let the sun go down on your anger means, but it does mean that we want to make sure whatever it means, it's, it's concerned with not giving an opportunity to the devil. And uh, that's mysterious in its own right, right? What exactly does that mean? The literal, the literal, the wooden Greek here says, give the devil no foothold. So as if he's climbing you, <laughs> as if you're a mountain that he's climbing and he found a good spot to be able to get up higher onto you as a mountain. And so um, I, I think this can help a little bit in saying, well, whatever it is that I'm going to let this, do, that I'm going to, I'm going to do, I want to make sure that my, my anger and my, my lack of reconciliation, uh, however long it goes, that I don't give him an opportunity uh, to, to, um, to get a foothold in my life. Second of all, now this is not something I expect all of us to be able to do. And so this is, I always feel a little strange offering this, but this phrase, actually occurs in Greek outside of the Bible. Now, you're probably, if you're, if you're thinking, how would I ever know that? Then you're right. I don't have an answer for you. I, I don't know, aside from reading maybe a little bit higher level commentaries, there are certain, there's certain knowledge that scholars spend their lives trying to run down certain Greek phrases and certain things that occur in first century Greek um, that we, we who don't have access to that or, or don't have their PhDs, it's really hard to get that information unless you're reading one of their commentaries or books about this. But in the commentary that I read, this appears, um, this is a common phrase, not on, not, not having to do with anger, but don't let the sun go down on whatever is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for make sure you take care of something quickly, but it doesn't necessarily mean an actual day. So you would, you would bring that in from the other Greek um, the, the way, you know, the expressions that people were using at that time. And then you could probably make a reasonable case to say Paul was using that expression the same way they were using that expression, to use it more as a metaphor and not as a literal command to not let the sun go down. Uh, and for those of you that are just joining us from and weren't here last week, um, I, I think that the, I think the difficulty is this, you're having a dis uh, you're having a fight with your husband or your wife. And 
you are trying to obey this verse. So you're trying to hash the fight out at three o'clock in the morning. And if you started the fight at midnight, um, you know, and I will definitely say there have been times when in my marriage with my wife where we very unwisely started a, a, a difficult discussion late at night. Um, and it's just not being resolved. Well, why? One of the reasons it's not being resolved is that you're both tired. You're just, your bodies are worn down at the end of the day and you're extra angry and you're, you're, there are going to be words that you're going to say in the middle of the night because you're tired that you wouldn't say if you had more sleep. Your flesh is just being given free reign over your body at that point. But a lot of couples trying to obey this verse, they've, they've set in their, in their minds that we will never uh, go to bed angry with one another. Um, and I say, on the whole, keep that. That's like, that's good. But if that becomes a legalistic thing where you think, man, I've got to do that. And the Lord is going to be angry with me if I ever fall asleep and am still angry with my wife. I, I, then, then I want to, I want to question that. And I want to say rather what we should do in marriage is always aim at the earliest possible opportunity to reconcile with one another. And if that comes before the sun goes down, wonderful. But if you can strategically in the moment of anger say, I don't feel like we're getting anywhere right now. And I think we should wait. I think we should sleep. I think we should wake up in the morning and set aside time to where we can talk about this. I think that that is a good strategy, knowing your weakness and frailty and sinfulness. So I'm getting this uh, from other, other sources outside of the Bible when it comes to how Greek was used. And that's the, that's the answer that I would give. And I'm, we're not 100% sure. Any other follow-up questions to that or anything else? Um, I'm going to add, I want to add to that. I yeah. was, um, when we first got married, I was reading a book where they took this verse and they said, instead of using the do not let the sun go down on your anger as like your standard, use the second part to give no opportunity to the devil. Good. And their point was kind of like what you said, like if the fight is just going to be worse by having it now, there is no harm in either sleeping on it or, or separating whether, you know, he goes in another room, I go in another room and we both think our, our sides through so that when we come together and have that conversation, you're not saying things that are just hurtful, be just to be hurtful. Cause that's obviously more, um, uh, it's less helpful than if you actually just waited and, and talked it out. And I, I feel like we've, we've in the fights that Bing and I have had, I've noticed that when we just go at it, at it, at it, even if it's like in the middle of the day and we just go at it, it's much more hurtful for the both of us than saying, okay, time out. You go upstairs. I'll stay down here. Even if we stew on it, I almost feel like we both get a chance to be like, okay, that's a little selfish. Okay. He's a little right on this one, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And when we finally get a chance to talk, it's a much calmer and less hurtful conversation. And I feel like we get more said more substantial things said and done because we've actually gotten a chance to think through it instead of just going by our emotions. So right. in, so personally for us, we, we'd rather stop and think about it than go at it. Cause we, we'd end up, we, we both admit it, we'd end up saying things that we, we obviously cannot take back. So That's we, great. we'd rather go with that second part. Don't give that devil a foothold on you. Then don't let the sun go down on your anger. Yeah. And I don't think you're picking between the two. I think you're just letting both of them together have like um kind of give a meaning to what to what paul is trying to say there and i think that's uh i think that's very good and and, and the only thing i'll add is that it also has to do with things like have you eaten you know some people get really hangry and they just life is is they're just very very pent up and angry if they haven't eaten and so have you eaten have you rested can you get away from stressful things and actually focus on your marriage and reconciling? I think a lot of these things are, are really, they seem very unspiritual, but they are very spiritual because we are, we are beings that are where 
our spirit is affected by our, um, our bodies. And, you know, and so we're, we're all connected. We're not just separate spirit and bodies. We're, we're all together uh, in one. And so, yeah, we want to think about that in marriage. And for those of you that are not married, it's, it's, uh, it's good to consider these things now on how you will fight and sort of ground rules that you guys will make with one another for, for fighting. That's, that's an important part of any kind of pre, uh, pre-engagement, premarital uh, kind of uh, conversation is how will we fight? What are the rules? And so. Um, GD, uh, I had yeah. another uh, follow up with one of your questions there in regards to the live that kind of um, is what a little bit needing to be settled out before you consider anything else. Yeah. Um, uh, so say, say, um, was there a question? Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so you know how like the term that people think, oh, you know, it's like a, a little white lie type of thing. Like, how do you kind of disclose to people that like uh, the lie in itself is kind of like to be um, regarded as a, a covers up the sin that needs to be also addressed as well. And and then as you said before, like that it is playing or not allowing the person to truly repent. Um, so I want to like understand the uh, address the details or even think that lying as like a little white lie, like even those spectrums um, is still something that needs to be addressed before trying to target their own sin, you know? Yeah. And would you also, I, sorry, I, I, sorry, really quick. And then I have to remember one more, one more thing. Like, how do you also allow them, uh, the person to tell them that like, uh, if they feel like they just withhold the truth? I don't know if that's overtly lying as well, but I feel like that's also on a similar spectrum to not like really say it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think withholding the truth I think withholding the truth often is lying. I don't know that I could give a, a definitive statement on when exactly and all the, you know, I, I don't know that I could say right now, every instance of withholding the truth is always lying. But when it comes to sin and when it comes to um, covering up sin, uh, you're going to be what we're called to do is we're called to expose. We're called to we're called to walk in the light. First John. We're called to expose the deeds of darkness, and that's actually talked about here in Ephesians. Like even other deeds of darkness, we're called to expose, but especially our own. And um, lying is a way of of covering that up. It's a way of uh, pretending that you are better than you are. It's a way of pretending that you you are. It's essentially a, it denies the gospel. Because what it says is that I am, I am not in need or, or as in need as I actually am. And so lying is a major, major factor in the Christian life. And a person who lies has very, very little chance of, re- of actual repentance as long as they're lying. And so I don't know if they're, I mean, I, I didn't fully get the question. I apologize. Um, you were actually breaking up uh, and I didn't hear it. But uh, just to reiterate maybe a, a little bit on that is that it is so incredibly serious because um, a person who's consistent, their settled um, way of life is to lie, is a person that will mask their sin from other people for the whole of their life. And that ultimately lying in that way is, is, is in a sense, it's a, it's a damnable offense. In other words, it's, it will send a person to hell. Um, Why do I say that? Because the only way to find salvation is to come to Christ and to repent and repentance is, is speaking truth about who you are. It is seeing yourself in the truest possible sense and then coming to Christ as the only one who can, who can save you because of what you see in yourself. And as long as you lie to yourself and as long as you lie to others, uh, then you will never actually be able to come to 
uh, repentance. You, now we do little, we do little games uh, where we will not, we will repent a little bit. Like we will find the best possible way to say something. So we don't look that bad. And then we won't tell the whole story. And I know my own heart and I know, you know, and because I know my own heart, I can probably say this is true for other people as well. We want to make ourselves look better, even in our quote unquote repentance. And so withholding truths to make ourselves look better um, is a, is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And so, um, so yeah, that answers my question. I know uh, I didn't say uh, uh, an actual like uh, address question, but it does bring to the fact of the matter that as Christians, we do need to check people's hearts. But first, let's see how they did they disclose what's on their heart, or they cover it up. You know, so um, I feel like that's a very applicable to discipleship accountability, even in our care groups. You know, um, I feel like that's something that a lot of us should do, either as members or even non-members, to just really indicate that you know like there is a severity in where this person is in their walk and how to really address how they could come to know that uh the lying is actually what needs to be addressed so that they can actually turn to repentance properly rather than half repentance as he said you know yeah yeah lying sin so they would repent and i, I of understand that lying. as well because it's all yeah yeah. So they would repent of lying just like they would repent of anything else. And that's, and that's, and that, ha that has to be done. It has to be done for every one of us that comes to Jesus. We come to Jesus in the truth, you know? So let me move on from that. Let's move on to uh, Ephesians 4:28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now I doubt that most of you have a struggle with stealing. It's funny. I knew a pastor once who confessed that he, you know, uh, you know, a lot of pastors will confess, um, you know, they'll, they'll confess certain sins in their lives with one another. And, um, you know, sometimes it's lust and sometimes it's pride and sometimes it's greed. And, you know, you, you get kind of the same sins that a lot of people and pastors to deal with. And uh, this pastor confessed one time in front of a group of pastors that he struggles with stealing. And I was like, wow, that, I mean, that shouldn't shock me. We're all sinful, but that's not one you hear of every day. So, so there, there are, there are people in the church, including pastors where this is a thing for them, maybe because of their past before they came to Christ um, there is sort of a pathological thing called kleptomania, which can happen where people feel an impulsive need to steal. Um, but uh, I think the idea here is that this person has come out of a lifestyle where that's what they did. That was how they got along in life. And, and, but, but what Paul says is rather than, rather than the easy way, rather than, okay, I could steal this and, I, and it could be mine and I don't even have to work for it. But he, he actually contrasts that with labor. Now the word labor is actually a pretty strong word there in the Greek. It's toil. It's, it's the kind of sweaty, you know, back breaking work where you get home at the end of the day and you're tired, you are exhausted. That's what the word really communicates there. Rather than go and take something for free, which is stealing, Go and labor and toil and work. And what does he say? Doing honest work with your own hands. And why? What is it that all of this is aiming towards? This is fascinating to me. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So when we talk about what does Christianity say about stuff like personal property? You know, you've probably heard that there have been Christians at various points in the history of the church that have used Acts chapter two to argue that, you know, we should sort of be a commune society, right? Like, like remember how Acts chapter two says that they, the early church had all things in common. And it says that they would, whenever anyone had need that they would sell, uh, they would sell their possessions and they would give it to those who, who had need. And the, 
the picture of that is one of let's get rid of personal property. Let's throw personal property into a centralized location. And then let's just all live out of that central, that central um, pot. And number one, I don't think that's what X2 is saying. And I don't think that's what the Bible is saying. And number two, I come to verses like this, where Paul has a special burden on a person doing labor so that they, this is important, the beginning of this line, that they may have something to share with anyone in need. And one of the important things about personal property is that you cannot give something you don't have. So personal property and, and, and owning and possessing things is a gift from God, but it's also a system of the world that we live in, in this country at least, where uh, we believe in you having things. Now, why would a Christian care about you having things? Because of this verse. Because when you have things, when you have a bank account, when you have possessions, now you have a responsibility to be generous with those things. And how much is something we leave between you and God? But the very fact that you have it in the first place means that you now have a decision to make on how much of it to share with those who are in need. And that's a responsibility that is gone from you if we were to, for instance, decide to start the Echo Church Commune and we were gonna just take all of our stuff and we were just gonna bring it into the middle. We were gonna say, okay, now the church will control all this and give it out. Well, you don't have now any, anything to be able to share. You, you gave it all up, which is, you know, so you were generous, but you, you have nothing left to, to be generous with. So that's a, that's, a, that's a concept, and I think it's a thing, and I think it's something that we, we, need to, we need to really consider when it comes to individual property and property rights. Those are important things for Christianity because we need to be, um, we need to be generous with the things that we have. So any questions or thoughts on that? We should yeah, work. I like, go ahead. Sorry. No, um, I like how you, when, when we did membership class, you, you kind of touched upon this. Yeah, um, yes. Yeah. And I kind of, re I really enjoyed how you said it where it's like, I don't, I, you don't mean that, um, you know, like I sell this now so that I can give it to you now, but if you like really need something and I don't have the resources to give it to you now, then I go sell what I have so that I could have the resources to give it That's to right. you. That's right. So it's, and it, it kind of touches upon like stewardship, kind of like we take care of our stuff so that if we have to sell it or let somebody borrow it, it's there ready and a, a resource for everybody. And I, I really like the, like the way that you kind of explain it that way and like look at it that way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think, that's, I think that is what it's saying. And uh, I think if you look at the whole of scripture, that is, that is what it's saying when scripture speaks about generosity. Um, and so, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's an important thing that we should, we should work hard and we should have something. Okay. So just stop there for a sec. We should work hard and we should have something and then we should be generous with what we have. And if you follow those three things with like, you know, your future career and all things like that, you're, you know, assuming you don't get into a sinful career, like a career that is just sinful by itself, um, you, are, you are doing good um, to the society around you. You're doing good for your church. You're doing good for your family, which by the way, um, first, first Timothy says that a man who does not care for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. So you've got that as well, that you have a responsibility for your family to care for them. So I think this is an important, it's a little verse, but I think it's a very important verse for thinking through when it comes to how we should live and how we should think about things like property and working and things like that. Um, so other hey, questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know, for some reason, I was just kind of like thinking this through and for some reason it was reminding me of like Genesis. I don't know why, but like, uh, is there in some way similar to how like when God created earth it's like the earth is his workmanship and then he also provided eden to adam and, and eve i mean i'm not sure if that's like 
I don't know if there is a direct connection, but I don't know, for some reason, I feel like there's, like, a, a nice, like, I don't know, I just felt like there was, like, a, an associated characteristic that God has shared to yes. do, is people to know that you had to be generous with what you have as much as God has been generous. I mean, I'm not trying to say this is directly from the text. I'm just saying that that's just something that kind of convicts me, like, like God's character and his love and compassion is shown through his people. Um, yes, and yes. As work hard, you know, like, God made work good uh, for a reason that we are working, you know, and, um, you know, yeah, that's just kind of like one thing I just want to input as a thought. Yeah, yeah, I think that the main thing communicated in Genesis is the dignity of work. Uh, before, and we're going to actually cover, we're doing a short series on Genesis this summer, so we'll actually be talking about these exact ideas, but the dignity of work, what, that, what, that, what I mean by that is before the fall, the plan of God for man, which is the greatest, most joyful man could ever be, is operating under the plan of God outside of sin in perfect fellowship with him. Think about that. No greater joy we could possibly have than perfect fellowship with God, doing what God has asked us to do. And what did God ask us to do before the fall? Uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2, he places the man in the garden to work it and to keep it. So that, the idea there is to do hard work in it, and then the idea is to protect it. That's what the word keep means. And so you've got working and keeping happening right then and there when everything is perfect in the world and there is no sin. And there is incredible joy and meaningfulness and dignity attached to work. And when we rob somebody of that, when we take away their ability to work, such as when a pandemic happens and people who were going to work no longer have a job to go to anymore, things start to break down things start to happen because there is an innate human dignity associated with going to work or whatever it is you do for work and working a meaningful day and getting home at the end of that day. We all feel this. Everyone who works feels this. You get home and you're tired. And yet at the same time, there was a sense that despite the way your boss treated you or despite the way the day went, you did something that day you actually accomplished something. Uh, and you get home feeling tired, but in some ways meaningful. And if you compare that with somebody who doesn't go to work or who doesn't have a job, it's one of the biggest factors for mental health because they're actually going away from, they're not able to partake in something that God has given them as human beings to do. And it's tragic. And there's no, there's no simple answer for getting everybody to work. I, I'm not saying I have a simple answer. I am saying this is a human need. And it's something that we've got to really consider when we think about other people. Um, work is a necessity for humans. So, okay. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Oh, man, James chapter 3 starts by saying that we should not take lightly becoming a teacher, because a teacher is somebody who, who, what, who uses their words for a living. And he says, the reason for that is because nobody can tame the tongue. It is like the hardest thing, if you, if, you have, if you have your mouth in check, you're able to control your whole body. Like you got, you got everything in check. And so let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but what? But what does corrupting talk mean? Well, sometimes we look at what the opposite is. The opposite is that which is good for building up. So if I define corrupting talk as four or five words in the English language that I shouldn't say, as if this is a verse about swearing, then I'm really going to be woefully short of what this verse is saying. I'm really not capturing what it's saying at all. 
Because what we want to do is look at the opposite of it. What is good for building others up? Then go and go, okay, then corrupting talk is tearing others down. And that broadens the whole, you know, it broadens the scale a lot on how much is, how much can be sinful that comes out of our mouths. And of course, it's building others up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So you see that there's this whole, here's how we're supposed to use our mouths. We are supposed to build one another up. What did, if, what did the beginning of chapter four say? That as we're speaking the truth and love to one another, we are growing up into, a, into one temple, one holy temple in the Lord, but it's through speaking the truth to one another in love. So we're using our words back then and earlier in chapter four to build the church, but the church can also be torn down with words. And um, man, we have to be careful with our words. Uh, our, our, the words that come out of our mouths, but can I also add, we have to be careful with the words that we type. That's, a, that's in some ways, that's an easier way for our, our words to just be really quickly um, you know, a tweet in anger, you know, you never want to fire off a tweet in anger. You know, you never want to make a social media post in anger. You want to think about your social media posts because they can tear down. Um, just like your, your actual words coming out of your mouth can tear down. Um, and so I want to pause for there for thoughts or questions. Anybody? Okay. What about child discipline? Like if you're just like saying, oh, um, you know, like if you're a little frustrated and you happen to just like reprove your child in, a, in the midst of that anger, but then it turns into maybe something even a higher other end of like a spectrum, like from difference in something minor as just like saying no, or even like even explain that to maybe like discipline to maybe abuse where someone's just verbally abusing some, their, their child or even in general, like that's how life is in the household, you know? Cursing yeah. at their child. So, so. Yeah, no, um, I, I would argue that uh, parents should, first of all, parents are sinners and parents make mistakes. But if we're aiming for something, we should never aim to discipline in anger, ever. Um, if a parent needs to go into their bedroom for a moment and set the child, let's say that's a young child, two or three or four, set the child in their room while the parent goes and cools down, then that's, that is by all means what needs to happen. Because if a parent disciplines in anger, they're going to, they're going to display something that is not true about God to their children. Cause the, cause God does discipline his children, but he disciplines those he loves. So even though there are verses that speak about God's momentary anger with a Christian, um, it is true. God can be angry with you the way a father could be angry with you. God's anger is always righteous, uh, but God will not be angry long and he, his anger will always be righteous. I'm not so sure that you and I um, can always understand our own righteous anger and know that our, rank, our anger is righteous. And so I think that what often needs to happen is a lot of prayer and a lot of time with the Lord, making sure that um, our discipline of our children, which must happen, by the way, discipline must happen, um, that it is done in a way that is not uh, angry. And so it, that's, that's a really important thing to talk about. I'm glad you brought that up, Andrew. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is kind of thrown in maybe as a summary of all of this. Uh, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? Well, it seems to be talking about speech, seems to be talking about, again, speech here, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander. That's kind of speech-like. It seems here that the verse is surrounded by verses having to do with our mouths. And it sounds like the grief is potentially specified to how we use our language that grieves the Holy Spirit. Although we could easily say, well, there's plenty of other sin that grieves the Holy Spirit. 
but it seems that Paul, because he's using it right here, might be talking particularly in this verse about grieving the Holy Spirit with our words. Uh, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. That's, those are things that will destroy unity in the church. And remember, the whole chapter has really been about unity. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. I love these verses here that come right after things that we're supposed to do. Right after we get told to do something, we get told that we're supposed to do it in the way that God or or Christ has already forgiven you. So important for us in understanding the Christian life that we have an example and we've also had, we're supposed to put our minds on the fact that we ourselves have been forgiven. And that's what empowers forgiveness of other people and grace towards other people. And then we get to the end of this section, which is actually the end of the section is chapter five, verses one and two. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now that verses one and two are really the conclusion of all of this, 25 to 32. So if you want to say, well, Paul, so Paul is going to say, I'm going to sum up now everything that I have said in those last few verses in verses one and two, be imitators of God as beloved children. Um, So how do we use our mouths? How do we, how do we use our, our bodies in work? Um, All of those things were really the, um, the, the impetus, the main thing that Paul wanted to get across in that last section, but this next section is going to take a turn. So starting in verse three, he introduces the concept of sexual immorality. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. So this idea here is that we must be so far from these things that there isn't even the name of them happening uh, amongst amongst Christians. And, And this is one that... Uh, many Christians have not obeyed and many Christians have had to come back and repent of, and I understand that. And I know that, and it's, and yet the verse still stands. The verse is there in scripture and, and it is, there is a special weight that the Bible places upon sexual sin. And I'd like to talk about that for just a second. I'd like to talk about why sexual sin seems to make the top of every what we call vice list. Whenever we're told, whenever we've got a list of vices, a list of things we're not supposed to do, sexual immorality is often at the top of that. And one of the reasons why I would just like to show you comes in 1 Corinthians 6. I think. Um, I want, I want you guys to see the argument here that Paul makes down here. First Corinthians six twelve. all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Okay, that's fine. You guys are saying that. That's the why it's in quotes. Do you guys get that? The Corinthians were saying that. Hey, if you have a if you have a hunger for something, then then the thing that you're going after, how can that thing be wrong? So they applied it to food, and they used the metaphor for food, but they were trying to also use the metaphor for sexuality. If you have a hunger for sexuality, why not? then doesn't it justify the fact that there is this thing that God created called sex, which satisfies the, the, the hunger, the sexual hungry hunger in the same way God made food is food wrong. That food would be satisfying to a hunger that happens within a stomach. And Paul's response is that God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. 
but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So Paul starts by saying, look, your greatest purpose in life is not as a sexual being. Your greatest purpose is not sex. Your greatest purpose is to honor and glorify the Lord. That's what your body was made for. That's what you were made for. And then he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The Lord is for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Okay, so, so let's just continue the argument. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Okay, so this is, this is the church argument now. And this is the fact that I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, which he's going to talk about in a sec, right? Um, I am a member of Christ's body. If I'm a member of Christ's body, then here's the argument. It's very vulgar. It is very vulgar. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Now, here's why I'm bringing up this. Um, there, the Bible has a way of viewing sex that is much more meaningful than the world's view of sex. Okay, And, I, and that may be obvious to some of you. And others of you may have heard, you know, this 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 idea that, you know, religious people hate sex, you know, religious people devalue sex. They don't push it aside, don't do anything with it, um, try to kind of ignore it, right? That's kind of like what, that, that, that kind of Puritan way that the world wants to say that Christians are, they call it Puritan. Um, actually, the opposite is true. Christians and the Bible view sex very, very highly. So highly that, that sex is a union between, between two people that forever changes those two people. And what the world says about sex is that, I heard one pastor say, it's like adult play. Like, it's, it's like the thing, like, when you're little, you go and you play with toys. And when you're older, you just, you know, you just go have sex. And that's, that's like how the world views it. It's like, why, why would I not be able to do this with my body? It's just as simple as when I was little and I decided to go play cars, you know, with somebody else. Or it's, it, is, it is like exactly the same thing to them. And Christians are saying, the Bible is saying, no. It's not. It is far more meaningful than that. And so for Paul to say, you are uniting the members of Christ with a prostitute when you have sex with a prostitute. And he says, or do you not know that he who is joined, this word joined is, you know, joined in sexual union to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. So when we think about sex, even from the very beginning in Genesis, where the two will become one flesh, that's where that is. This idea of two becoming one happens through the sexual act. Now, here's what God did in his grace to us. This act of coming together is so powerful that God actually put in place a covenant to protect that act because you are so vulnerable with another person when you come together with them in the sexual act that there needs to be a protection around that union and that relationship to where those two people are saying to each other, I will never leave you. I will never walk away from you because that act of coming together and going apart and then coming together with someone else and going apart and coming together with someone else and going apart that the world engages in is incredibly destructive to the human body, to the mind, to the psyche, to, to all of these things, not to mention the other repercussions that come about this abortions, ch children out of wedlock, all of those things. Scripture sees rightly when it comes to sex and it does not devalue sex. It increases the value a hundredfold of what sex is 
over what the world actually says sex is. And so Paul's reasoning and the Bible's reasoning for putting sex at the top of all of these lists is not a mistake. It is something that is very, very intentionally done because there is a power here that we don't even know the half of when it comes to that, the meaning of what that act actually means. And when it happens within marriage, it is a glorious and joyful and wonderful thing that actually builds a marriage. But when it happens outside, it is destructive. And, and that is the clear teaching of scripture. Um, notice this, flee from sexual immorality, verse 18. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. That is the Bible's way, I think. I think what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to argue here that what I'm saying about this heightened view of sex and what it actually means is being captured in these words right here. That it is a sin against one's own, own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Essentially, a person who engages in multiple um, sexual liaisons is devaluing their body. They are bringing their body down to, to the dirt. And what God is saying here is your body is so much more valuable because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit than the way you are, you are treating it. Um, and so this goes for women, this goes, which is obvious. Women tend to be much more hesitant to, to one night stands and things like that. But it also goes towards men who oftentimes are depicted as the ones who are more aggressive in trying to pursue this kind of sexual liaisons. And, and what men don't realize is that they are devaluing and demeaning their bodies just as much as women are in this situation. So I wanted to take a second to address that. We had the time to talk about it, uh, to address the idea of sexual immorality and why it occurs at the beginning of a lot of these lists and why it should not even be named among Christians because sex is for one purpose and that is to that is to enjoy within a covenant and and that covenant has to be there for sex to be there so questions thoughts anybody have pushback anything like that i just wanted to make sure we, that the teaching was clear on this and i don't get the chance to do this from the pulpit all the time because we're not always talking about sex we will talk about it uh this summer in genesis but it's important to talk about this from time to time questions or thoughts Speechless. We're all speechless. All right. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone, here we go again, who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Um, and I, I won't belabor the point, but it's just that they, there, is, there is unique, um, there are unique verses about sex in the Bible. And we should, we should hear them. We should hear them. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Okay. For at one time you were darkness. You guys remember Ephesians 2? Chapter two, verse one, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins, and you, were, you walked among the sons of disobedience, right? You were at one time darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk, if you are light, walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So fruit comes as you are walking 
you know, as you, the walking as children of light is the fruit that comes from being light. So if you are light, then what's going to come out of you are the, the kinds of deeds and things that are associated with the light. But if inside your darkness, then what comes out is the, the darkness, the dark things. And Jesus said that, you know, a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears, bears bad fruit. So here, Paul's just making that argument. Walk as children of light. Um, and here's the fruit that comes out. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I like that verse. You, so oftentimes we're thinking about what can I get away with? What can I do? What's the minimum that I can do here? And this verse says, try to figure out what God would just be so pleased with in your life and live that way. And take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Now he uses this Old Testament verse here. Awake, or I guess it's a hymn actually. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. This actually isn't an Old Testament verse. This is actually... This is actually a first century hymn that Paul threw into his letter. Isn't that interesting? It's something that, that they would have sung in the first century. And Paul says, hey, everybody knows this song, right? Let me just quote this song. It's like um, when I'm in my, ser uh, in my sermons, I will always quote one line from one hymn more than anything else. And that's when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upwards I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. And that to me, that line captures perfectly the way uh, we're to fight despair. We're to put our eyes on Christ and to see him. And so um, I, I'm trying to be like Paul, I guess, when I'm, when I'm trying to preach, I'm trying to say, hey guys, you know this hymn that we sing all the time? Let's actually, you know, let's talk about that hymn. This is what he's doing here. Um, he says, look carefully then how you walk not as wise, but as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Um, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Very similar to up here, where he said, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. He says it again, understand what the will of the Lord is. Go do what God wants you to do and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. Now, this right here is going to transition us into the next section because there are four things now associated with being filled with the Spirit. The first one is that we would address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I always thought that that meant like that. I don't know if you've ever seen like a musical where they just, they just sing to each other. Like they just, instead of talking, like they sing to each other. And I always thought... That, that just feels so cheesy to me because I think of musicals and I just think, you know, I'm not a huge fan of musicals. And uh, I just think like, okay, why are they singing right now? Why aren't they just talking? And, you know, I, I, this is not what that means. It doesn't mean that that's the way we're all going to talk to one another. It just means that there is a, that there's a, there's a biblically saturated language in the way that we are and worshipful language in the way that we are addressing one another. And how does that come? Why does that come? That comes because we're filled with the spirit that we're singing regularly. You know, singing, singing is, is a really important thing because singing engages the heart with certain words and content. When you sing something, you can't help but feel. Oftentimes I can't sing in my day unless I'm happy in my day. And there is, there is such a thing as singing lament or singing, singing songs of lament, which, um, you know, even certain forms of, um, of like African-American slave spirituals, like songs that they would sing in the fields. Those were not happy songs. They were in, they were in slavery at the time when a lot of those songs were written and developed. That wasn't, hey, my heart is joyful. That was, my heart is lamenting. I am grieving. And there are certain forms of music that come, that can come out of our lips when we are grieving. We're used to happy songs. That's pretty much what we do in the church. But there is such a thing as a lament, which is sort of a song that is, that comes out of you when you are, when you are deep in pain. And so it's, 
these so singing has to do with emotion and it has to do with our hearts getting engaged into what we're actually saying. And so we're addressing one another. We're talking in a certain way to one another. We're singing. We're giving thanks always for everything to God, the father in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then finally we are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I just want you guys to see, in case some of you are not here next week, what this last line means. This last line is the main line over the next, basically it's the next chapter. What does it mean to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? So you've got what Paul means by this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to state it, and then I'll just show you that this is the case. What Paul means by this is that there are certain groups in the church that he wants to make sure are submitting to other groups in the church. So um, this isn't, hey, every individual submit to every other individual. There are places that talk about that. There are places in, Bible, in the Bible where, where we're called to um, really like put one another first, um, place one another in, in a way where it, you know, there's sort of a submissive way where I'm willing to put your needs above my needs, you know, that whole thing. But here we can very easily, if we just ended here on this verse, we could very easily just think, okay, every single person is supposed to submit to every other kind of person, but look at where this is going. So submit to one another because the Holy spirit is in you. So submit to one another Wives, submit to your own husbands, okay? So what does submit to one another here mean? It means that I wanna talk to the wives and then I wanna talk to the husbands and I wanna tell the husbands how they need to not submit but love their wives. And then he's gonna go on in chapter six to say, I wanna talk to kids and I wanna talk about how to, to kids and I wanna talk about how kids need to obey their parents and submit to their parents. And then I wanna talk to he says, and then I want to talk to slaves, and I want to talk to those who are, who are in uh, the, the first century form of slavery, and I want to say, submit, submit to your masters. Wow, that's not what I thought at first when I thought, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. No, he actually has particular groups in mind that he wants them to see that there is a submission authority structure going on within those groups themselves. And I included the Greek here because I just want you to see exactly what's happening here. It says submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it says wives submit to your own husbands, but that's not actually what this, what's happening here. Okay. So let me, I'm just going to read word for word what's actually being said here. So I'm just going to repeat the Greek gets this pretty good. I'm not going to show you Submit to one another, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, that, that's in the Greek. Then it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, the wives to their own husbands as to the Lord. What's missing there that's over here? Can anybody see that? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, that's the earlier verse, the wives to their own husbands husbands as to the Lord. What's missing in the Greek that seems to show up very explicitly here on this, on the English side. If I were to say to you a sentence and it said, the wives to their own husbands as to the Lord. Is that a complete sentence? We're missing the submitting part. We're missing the verb. Yeah. We're missing the verb. So verse 22, which in the English, to make it sound a little nicer, they added the verb submit. The verb here is missing in the Greek, because the verb is going back to this verb, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives submitting, just like the, out, the to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives submitting to their own husbands as to the Lord. 
So I just want you to see the connection between verses 22, 21 and verse 22 and going onward. It's actually relying on the verb from the, from the verse above. And that happens, by the way, in Greek. They don't, um, Greek uh, writers didn't feel the need to repeat verbs if the verb was already clear. So if it was already clear what we're talking about, then they don't need to repeat verbs. And this sentence doesn't have a verb in it. So they're grabbing the verb from, from verse 21, this submit verb, and then they're bringing it in and they're saying, wives, here's, what you, here's how you're supposed to live this out with your own husbands, okay, as to the Lord. So next week, we're going to talk about this whole section of submission. What does the Bible say about this, these things? And try to get a little bit more detailed into that. But I want you to understand before you leave that this section doesn't just end like this. It doesn't just stop at this verse here it goes on and it starts to talk. So sub the submitting to one another has a very specific meaning. It goes on to talk about all of the particular groups that are supposed to submit to those who they are in authority, uh, that are in authority sort of over them. So, so um, lots to talk about next time. It'll probably get, you know, this is where Christians start to, you know, debate and discuss. And I love that. I'm not afraid of that at all. And I think that that's a great thing to do with Bibles open, and especially in a, in a forum like this to talk about, um, talk about our feelings on these issues and try to get scripture in front of us as we talk about this. So I want to invite you all back uh, next week to have a good uh, discussion over uh, what does it mean? Wives submit to your own husbands. What does it mean? Husbands love your wives. And we'll try to get into the other groups as well. So that's a little teaser for next week. And um, let me pray for us and we will be done. Lord Jesus, I, I pray God that you would help us to be obedient to what we have been called to do. We had a list of commands that came your way. And we know that your letter is not just a list of commands. We know that your letter is first and foremost, the gospel. And that now we're supposed to walk in light of the gospel. We're supposed to if we are in the light because you have died on a cross and set us free and we've had our sins forgiven and then we're supposed to then walk in the light. And so God, I pray you would help us, um, help us to be free from besetting sins, help us to be free from areas where our mouths are still using coarse joking, help us to be free from every hint of sexual immorality, help us to be free from lying, help us to be free from ways in which we have not worked hard toiling with our hands so that we have something to be able to give to others. Help us, Lord. We need help in these areas. And we know that even the way Ephesians is set up is that you're showing us that we have power. We have every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places being given to us to be able to engage in this kind of life. And so call us to it. And now empower us afresh and fill us again with your Holy Spirit to live the way you've called us to live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody. Uh, good to be with you all. And uh, I do uh, would love for you all to come back next week. And let's have a good uh, talk about Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and on. So I'm looking forward to that. And we'll see you guys on Sunday. Bye-bye.